Okay. So where did we let things off? We were saying like this optimization as a process, a single update. What can we do with that? And also one question that was uh, raised during the break is, but how do we include information from the public? That's what we'll do now. So let me present the canonical online optimization algorithm, the so-called online gradient descent, OGD. It's as simple as that. It's based on the projected gradient descent step. So we implement this in X. Fantastic. We observe, we suffered a loss, observe all online parameters, refer to the red uh, scribble over there, and we compute the next decision. And that's my step. One step toward the 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 the, the, the gradient uh, the grade uh, maximum decrease uh, direction with the step size that is where did I put judiciously chosen I'll get back to that and I'll get eventually to a bounded regret and the projection can be to uh, with regard to any norm I'll use a two norm but that's just the closest point within our decision set then what we get is that if we recall our assumption so I, and that's really much just what I need. Bounded function, bounded regret, and a comeback and comeback set, meaning that my decision is also bounded. So if I set my step size in the following way, so to be inverse, inversely proportional to the square root of t, then the OGD's static regret will be bounded by the following form, which is O square root of t, and therefore sublinear. It resembles the address of the ad bound with we had before. So that's great. With only the single, going back to that, the single projection step, projected gradient descent step, I'm able to kind of control my losses, let's say cut my losses and perform just as good that I will eventually get to the uh, optimal decision. That's great, that's just enough. And so the, 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 the gradient here is where I can do past information. And because it's gradient, there's kind of a, we have kind of a leftovers from previous rounds as well, but that's really where We'll add in some information from the last one. So we can picture this one. The, 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 the gradient of the last one that I presented there would include S, would include P. That's just enough. Sounds good. So in the next slide, I presented the proof. I'll go very quickly, high level description, because what's nice about it, it's only it only needs a bit of complex analysis, and we're done. So in any case, I put on the whole proof more detail than the previous one, so that you can look at it offline. But the first thing we notice is, oh, FP is, FP is complex, that's fantastic, we get the first bound. And why is that nice? Recall the regret definition that was, oh, far along. FT, XT, minus FT, X, R. So I can bound, I can bound this difference by the, by the gradient. Great. Now let's bound the gradient. So if I take the, the next decision and I subtract it to the best decision in the time side, so that's that's the the, the, the the term I have here, and I work out the map, the map. So first I take the two norm, and I start bounding things. I can rewrite, I can obtain a bound on my gradient. So this is nice over here because that also overbounds the difference. So I can put all of that together in the regret definition. And I already have a bound that is a function of how close I was to the optimum at t minus how close I was at the optimum at t plus one plus some term of the gradient. Now I can rearrange things so that um, so that I get something a bit more interesting in terms of the step size. Why is that nice? This is a telescopic sum, so I'll, get, I'll be able to get rid of it. The last thing I'll have then is to bound this square of the gradient. So that's where I'll choose y to be my step size to be proportional to the square root of t. And that will allow me to bound the sum of the square root of t to the square root of capital T, again by a telescopic sum. And that leads me to my regret bound. So that's kind of we have had eight steps, but I feel like it's more like three important steps that enables us to just look at the regret. So in a few slides, I was able to almost convince you that it has a regret bound. So that's that's neat about, that's what's neat about it, that we can come up with our own extension and bound it.
But what's nice about the OGD is that we can also enjoy a dynamic rate. So the only difference we have to do here is we have to set the step size to be to be constant and inversely proportional to the square root of the time horizon this time. Then we get a dynamic regret bound that is of this order, so proportional to square root of t times b t plus 1. And therefore, it's sublinear if this b t, the cumulative variation, is less than square root of t. So it is indeed a stricter condition on the problem via this, this term. But in some cases, it's a much better guarantee. So just as a reminder, I included the cumulative variation description at the bottom. So that's very interesting. We get to track the realm of thema if the problem does not change too much. What do we expect? Only making one step, and we have no information about the future. But that's still a very interesting way. So let's, let's skip this. But I really wanted to include it just in case. I think it's a very detailed version. OK, extension, my favorite word. So we can think of many, many. So first one, strongly complex function. Always better, always perform better. So if FP is strongly complex, then we get a tighter regret bound. In the static case, we got a long T regret bound, which is fantastic. And in the dynamic case, we get a VT bound. So we, so we can track problems that are up to almost linear. Types of feedbacks, and that's what the, that's the, the example I'll present uh, after. We can have, uh, okay, what we have before for information, but also bended OCO, merging the two topics of today. So that would be the case where if I only get, if I look at the board, the six, I won't get ST, I won't get BT, it's just the value of F. What can I do with that? Turns out I can do kind of a lot. Uh, so that's an, an example. Distributed OCO, so we want local decision to be computed locally. Time varying constraint, so this curly X becomes curly XT. We can have second order update, so that's uh, part of the, 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 the Research what I'm doing. So the premise is Newton's step. So Newton's method is super linear. What can we get out of this? So I mean the offline Newton method. That's interesting. Binary decision making. That's another example I prepare if we have time, which is nice. I mean we have to lose in the title of the the, the, the framework convex indeed, but more, uh, many decisions are actually uh, binary. So that's that's interesting. And there's the predictive. We have a bit of information about the future. or rolling horizon. Okay, so let's illustrate that with a demand response, just to, 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 to circle back to that. And then I'll do one example of binary constraint. So demand response of flexible loads, we want to this time modulate power consumption, so in a continuous fashion, a flexible load in exchange for a reward. I'll put aside the reward part for now. I'm not an economist, so I'm just picturing that economists do that. And I'll just focus on the decision-making so we can picture any types of flexible load, electric vehicle charging, air conditioning or repeat pumps, water heater. That's great. But what I want is to control an aggregation. So picture this humongous residential load station, and I want to control each of them to, for some task. The advantage here, it's for infrastructure investment. I don't think I have to convince you. Uh, and it's renewable. So I'm saying that because there's some jurisdiction that bought a lot of wind turbines, but that was very uh, intermittent, so they bought a lot of fast ramping gas turbines to account for it. Noise. In any case, no, 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 no politics, uh, no, no editorial, but yeah. So we can do this frequency regulation with this kind of setting, and so by using it on a very fast time scale, and that's what we'll be doing. So the problem is exactly the problem written in, in, uh, in, uh, in red. We want to track a power set point, I guess I defined it before, ST, I'll add this P naught T, which is the base load. Everything that is not flexible, I have to account for it. So for example, it could be the base consumption of a house, but it could also be the fact if I stop using the AC of some house, it might hit its upper bound, and now the backup controller just forces it to be on, so that I have to account for its power consumption. So that could be what's hidden in this P naught T. And then PT would be the load response, so that could be the consumption of this air conditioner or the heat pump. And XT is my decision, so we can picture it as control as well. So minus one to one, to make it simple, minus one would be uh, increasing the, 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 the consumption, and plus one would be uh, curtailing the load. Why is it nice to include both? 
because I could say have something that in the long run have no consequence. So the average control could be zero, or the average consequence of my program could be zero. So that's a, that's that's better to convince or to encourage people to sign up to this program. And that and, and then in this formulation, I'll add this R. I haven't described it just yet, but it's a regularizer. It's a side objective. I could put on a L1 norm of XT. Actually, it's not. Um, so, so I can have an L1 norm, so I want a sparse decision, or I could have uh, something that I'll use later on. I want, if I have thermostatic, thermostatically controlled load, I want to encourage load to be as close as possible to their desired temperature. That's one way to regularize it. Do, like, follow the set point, just keep in mind that we want to be comfortable. Okay, I'll introduce one more algorithm here. It's a little bit of taking gradient descent. Uh, so the main advantage is, so if we look at the first two terms, so this is just reformulating the projected gradient descent. So this eta gradient plus this, this is this is equivalent very much to the OGD. In fact, this is more the form that we one would use in mirror descent, but mirror descent with the Bregman divergence becomes the OGD. So that's very much the same. And actually, if you want to play the convex analysis game, that's a good equivalence to show. But what's nice here is I do not have to take a gradient step on R. I just add it back here. So if I want to promote sparsity, a gradient descent step is not super good. But if I want to minimize here with respect to R, that's more interesting. So that's just to, all of that to say, it's spatially tailored to round independent regularizer. Because that's the important thing. There's no subscript T on this R. So using this algorithm, setting the uh, descent step, step descent, the, the step size inversely proportional to capital T, we get a regret bound that is very much the same order as the OGD, but with a free regret right. Great. So here are the extension. I want to consider four types of feedback. Full information, exactly what I told you about since, since this morning. Bended or limited. So that's the one. I will only have access to a power measurement at the feeder level. So we can picture that. If I go back to that slide, no, that's the one. I'll only get a me an aggregated measurement of P naught T plus PT scalar uh, XT. So that's just my measurement at the feeder, and I wanted to track the set point. So that, that becomes very interesting. I don't have to have any sensoring or meter, even dedicated metering for it. It's very low information, and very private as well, which is, uh, which is another uh, advantage. Yes, please. Oh, I, I, I'm, I'm, let's say the aggregation. I'm just making that up, but like if I go back to my slide and that was my aggregation, I get one measurement for everyone. I'm just assuming they're all on the same computer. Not the half. That, that's the full information case. Very much just like 100 kilowatt, and that's it. Deal with it. Oh, no. Okay. Then the third, I want partial bender. So if some people, I, let's picture have the full information setting, but some people opt out because of privacy reasons. We respect that. But also some people just don't have the metering infrastructure just yet. That's also good. So what can we do with partial full and partial end? The last case had to do with more of the communication burden. At each realm, we'll either use full information or bend it for everyone. That reduces my communication burden, and we can actually show that this enjoys, in the expected sense, the same regret bound as the full information case. So why not? Okay, so what does this look like in simulation? So I'll be implementing that on thermostatically controlled loads. Uh, we consider this decision variable. I'm tracking an arbitrary set point and a sign of T. One of the loads should be a sort of low cap N. And uh, the performance of each load, I'll, I'll, I'll make them noisy. So I'll be very very much focusing on which load to, who, what is the decision I want to allocate to everyone so that their noisy or uncertain performance tracks my set point. So that's what's reflected in the PT plus a, 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 um, a bounded uh, Gaussian noise. The regularizers I'll be using are the one I described, sparsity and desired temperature. So here there's a bit of trade-off. I, I, I set the trade-off as when it was still good performance 
for tracking and for my visors, and I run the simulation for 600 times. So, and I mean, this is in the millisecond realm, so and on my humble email sending computer, so it can scale to very high uh, the, the dimension. So what we get here, so just as a benchmark, do is I implement nothing, so just full losses. So in red, of course, the worst performing algorithm is the bandit. So full line is the one with my my regularizer, but actually it might be better to look at the dotted line. So that's what we get, something like 35% decrease. It's pretty good. I mean, I basically did very little. For, I just measure at the feedback, uh, the speeder level, and get some tracking or some first step in my uh, frequency regulation. Then partial bandit with a bit more information, I'm able to drop. A little bit. So again, just looking at the dotted line. So that's better. And then Bernoulli, around the same scale, and I think I was using give or take ten percent of rounds with full information. That's great. And then when I go on to the full information setting, I'll, I'll be back to you. I get kind of very good performance at something like 90, uh, 90 ish, ninety five percent uh, tracking. So that's great. Just show the next slide, and I'll be back to you. So what does this look like? It's the following. So even if I have very noisy resources, I'm able to track my sign. On the left, that's the full information. We notice we're not able to track at the top, but that's just because of the regularizer. It's too demanding for the L1 regularizer. It will never go that way. And then I wanted to show this picture because that's the Bernoulli feedback setting. So some rounds are random. So I have a random gradient estimator. So that's what makes it very noisy, but with only 10% of full information round, I kind of get the, like, I can, yeah, I'm, I'm not doing that bad, so I can track the set point. Sometimes I go off, but that's the the, 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 the random gradient estimate, but I'm still uh, keeping track of the set point. Yes, question? Yeah. Okay, so I'm not adding noise. I'm just making it like that to deal with uncertainty. Okay, I'm just, I want to picture that I do, my point is I don't want to assume I know the loads well, so people can come in the, it's a, it's a PCL, so people come in in the room, they leave the door open, changes this, changes this, so that's why. Yeah, it's not for privacy. My privacy argument are, I want one number for the speaker. I don't want to disaggregate other consumption. That would be my privacy. So you won't be surprised uh, to hear my answer. So there's an extension to that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so yeah. Uh, at some point I thought, I actually, historically, I thought I would look into it, but then on the paper, I was like, oh yeah, of course someone did it. Yeah, so yeah. <laughs> so yeah, very, I mean, very interesting. Okay, so okay, the question is, if I go to this slide, right, is that sublinear? I'm not showing the regret. I haven't showed. So for the next one, I think I have a re, I might have a reason why. Uh, if you look at the full paper, there's a regret. Uh, is there? I, I don't remember, but uh, yeah, this is just a loss. Uh, I think for the next example, I might have. Uh, as I mentioned before, we. The proof is there, and that would just be a single experimental regret. So sometimes I say a lot of people tell me the regret, but I think I have it. Yes, at the back. Okay, because okay, that's what I meant. Because with the regularizer, I mean you have to set up the the weight. So just picture like this log function. I add in this. I must tell you that I hated being the one to decide what's good and what's not. 
So in our current work, we made it so that we have no hyperparameter. Everything should come from the map. So there's no users like me that needs to make a decision. But yes, indeed. Great. Okay, and last example. That's kind of, we're, we're, we're getting to the end. Hopefully you're not too tired or, and, or enjoying it. I want to talk about binary decision making as my last extension. This is very, I'd say very fresh work. Julien sent you one of the video I have that I posted on the Slack yesterday. So I, in any case. So here I want to talk about real-time network reconfiguration. So we can picture our distribution grid with all those exotic behind the meter grid edge technology devices. So EV charging, uh, PVs on houses, and also the demand response uh, folks that register to the other program we just mentioned. They're also part of that. So that really much altered the demand profile in our distribution grid. So there's we can better optimize the topology of our grid to minimize losses. So, in fact, we can open and close switches and get this minimum loss network topology. Traditionally, I mean, at least in Quebec, we were sending crews with very long stick to activate the switches. So, let me tell you that we did not do that very often. Okay? But nowadays, they, they have those remotely operated switches, and this is, this is electronic, so we might as well do it as much as possible and get the best performance and save a few kilowatt, megawatt, or whatnot. Why not? Especially for burning coal or gas or anything, right? So we can re reshuffle the, the topology on a very fast time scale. So that's what I'm talking about. So the problem, in, in, in kind of graph theoretic terms, is a minimum starting tree with powerful dependent weights. But for us, online optimization folks, we need to account for binary decision particles. So the problem yeah, is that it's optimal condition. Yes, this is network yeah, optimal net network configuration. Yeah. Yes. So it can be set as an optimization problem. Uh, so we could use like a SDR, a semi-definite relaxation, SOCR, and get a very good problem. But could we solve it on a 10,000 or let's say a 1,000 meter on the flat time scale? I, I, I do not think so. In my example, I still use 100, but this approach really scales because we want to do it on very large problems. So the problem we have at hand is the following. See, I omitted the convex in the, the, the title because it's not. But we have all my optimization with binary constraints. So I still have my curly x. That is my. Um, that is my constraint specific, uh, my, my con convex specific constraint. But I want to take the intersection with the binary set. So I have general general constraint plus binary set. It's not convex. There's limited work by your truly. Uh, that used a randomized algorithm. But what we'll do to get better performance here is we'll kind of deal with structure of the problem and I'll assume that x is not convex anymore, but somewhat. In fact, what we have is online sum modeler optimization. So here, sum modeler is set function. So I'll make the transition from binary variable to set variables. So let V be my uh, base set of decisions. Then my if my decision used to be 0, 1, 1, 0, so switch 0 is off, uh, on, I mean open, uh, switch 2 is closed, switch 3 is closed, and switch 4 is closed open, then I will translate that in terms of set as two tree, meaning that two and three are the decision I'm implementing. I'll, I'll let now be uh, the sub function. And the sub modularity goes as follows. It's the diminishing marginal return uh, property. So I buy one item, it costs me X. So the per item cost is X. I buy two items, the cost is 1.5 X. So that means that the per item cost is now three quarter x. Great, so it diminishes. Then I, I buy a trio. So now I'll say it costs me two x's. So the per item is two thirds of x's, and so on and so forth. So the, by, by, uh, the per item cost diminishes now as we go. So that's the sum of the line. In this case, s, which, uh, which substitute x, the curly s, is my, cons is, is, is my constraint specific. Uh, 
So in the general case, unfortunately, so uh, by that I mean that S is not the power set of the base set, the base decision set. This problem is NPR. So again, not super, but in any case. So our regret analysis will make one small distinction here. We'll still compare it to the best solution in hindsight. So that's the dynamic <laughs> aspect. But because it's an NP-hard, let let's be humble and compare it to the best polynomial approximation of the solution. So that'll add a, an alpha in this, in this term over here. So what I mean by that is like all of my minimum quantity. You have, for example, the gradient of the that is, an alpha approximation of the best solution because of the NPR case. So our objective will still be, let's find a algorithm such that its alpha dynamic regret is sublinear, meaning that ST goes towards ST star, and while avoiding high losses and losses. So our approach to do that, we'll use greedy approaches. So the strategy is use the previous round loss function, find a proxy for it that is tractable, and let's solve it to optimize. So for that, we'll have to define the data approximation function that I call F tilde, over here, that just is an approximation that sandwiches, that is sandwiched, sorry, by the actual loss function, but that can also be solved to optimality. That might sound like a very specific approximation, but I'll get rid of that very soon. With that kind of algorithm, with that kind of approximation, I can propose the very simple OSGA, that is, solve to optimality the last round proxy, and I'll be just enough. And that leads me to a regret bound that is of the following form. So it's not the same notation as we had before because we deal with set. So over here, this is just the, the disjunctive union, but that basically is the VT term. It's not super clear. The VT term that we had before. So let's just say that it is proportional to VT as we had before. So in fact, given a beta approximation, we get a bound that is it's tighter than the regret of the OG, that is actually as good as the best online convex optimization I've ever been proposed so far within a constant that assumes strong convexity. So how do we do that? If we have no constraint specific, only binary constraint, then the regret is directly less than VT, which is great. We found back the, uh, the simplifier with and where I wanted to go with the beta approximation, turns out that there's a genetic approximation for any submodular function. And so if the beta approximation does not exist, we can still get a, re a, bounded, regret, a bounded dynamic alpha regret bound. Quite bound about it in this, but okay. That is within a constant of the one that is shown there. So the beta approximation just simplifies things, but it's not mandatory. Okay, so how do we apply to uh, our problem at end? It's by the online network configuration. So what we'll do is use one of the approximations of the OG literature, which uses the weekly mesh network. So let's picture our uh, distribution uh, system. Let's close all the mesh. Uh, sorry, so let's close all the switch, which is like <coughs> horrible for a distribution system operator because that means it's not radial anymore. But let's just do the exercise of picturing a distribution system that is fully connected, not fully connected, with all switch codes. This is, of course, the minimum loss uh, topology. So what we'll do is we'll remove one by one the lines that have switches that are open. Um, uh, sorry, we'll remove all, we'll, we'll remove the lines that have switches that lead to the highest losses. And that boils down to the following formulation, the online dynamics of the problem for the configuration. So, that's my objective. I want to sum up all the, 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 the losses, the, the, in this case it's the current, but all the losses of the line that leads to, uh, all, the, all the losses of the lines that I select, such that the line that I actually select leads to a spawning tree of the limit. So the constraint, the spawning tree, means that every load will be circular. And I have a tree topology, a radial topology, which is again kind of the axiom of the distribution theory. Great. So I can implement that, and what's nice about that is there is, my proxy is very uh, achievable. There is a humongous literature stream on minimum spawning tree. So I can use one of those algorithms. I use Prim's algorithm, but these are very efficient. 
alpha optimal algorithm and I can leverage it and I will very large problem. So the problem I'll be presenting might not seem large, but I tweaked them. So here I use the 33 distribution system, but I added a switch on every line. So I think the canonical case is kind of nine switches. Uh, and I, I put one on edge each of them and just make the best out of it. So what we have here, okay, it's not as big as we want. Oh, we have a regret curve for our next uh, for the question. So here I'm presenting the time average regret. Meaning it's just regret divided by T. This is what you see, it vanishes, then it's gone. So that's in the wall. For quads or a bigger scholar. Uh, and then, uh, is it green? Well, in any case. Uh, on the left, we have the cumulative losses just to, to see how we perform. So uh, the top one, the red one, is a, is a random controller, but radial, just as a sanity check. Orange is the BOGD. That's the other, the existing work that was on the, on, on this liter in this literature stream, which does not admit constraints. Uh, constraints. Except binary, so we, we added a projection step, so its performance bound does not even hold in this case. Then in the zoom section, we can appreciate a few things. So, uh, what do we have? So, black is if I solve a full on optimal network configuration problem using a certain order single order form relaxation, solve it to optimality, but only for nine switches time permitting, that's the solution I get. In, the, in still this greenish, that's our algorithm, so that's the second best. Just above it, there's the static hindsight solution. And then down below, there's the round optima that we, we, we put up very hard to beat, but we're, we're very close to it. That's just to give you a sense of what's going on. And then I prepare a video on a larger system, but my computer is not plugged, so it does not work, but I put it on, on Slack. I mean, it's not the most enter entertaining video. But here, what I have is a, the 135 bus system. I drew uh, switches to every line, so some of them do not matter. They'll always be closed. But, and then I add problem noise on every node of the system, and that just varies through time, and it, finds the, uh, it automatically finds the network on the configuration with uh, red lines being the uh, op being open lines. So you'll see it kind of just is entertaining to see how the system follows it. So yeah, so so that's the class results. So let me conclude uh, the online convex optimization uh, framework. So here, as I mentioned, it's to see the online, the, the optimization problem as a process. We iteratively want to solve the problem to get to our end. Also, we can extend it to a real-time decision-making problem. We want to shorten those time, those uh, discretized, uh, discretized uh, time step very narrowly, so we can take very good decisions, and we can and, uh, incorporate the new data we get and mitigate uncertainty. In this case, the next decision rule was set by an update rule, which was a single uh, iteration from a complex optimization algorithm, and we showed that it was quite enough. Maybe two step would be better. My answer would be show me the map. I'm very happy to to, to to be convinced that two step is always better, but that's more demanding. Performance guarantees, that was something that I hammered down. Always look for a sublinear regret bound. And lastly, word of the day, extension, so we can get to our problem at end. And that's really much what I wanted to discuss today. So I hope. You'll find way. I hope this is, this is all full, uh, helpful. I hope that you see an extension to your problem. I'm, of course, happy to chat about it or to send you papers. Oh, I saw that extension that is parallel and so on and so forth. Or to discuss about my ongoing research work on that topic. So, just to wrap up, we discussed online decision making algorithm and provided solution concept for each of them, but very importantly, to performance analysis. While some of them are heuristic, the performance are not. We, uh, we discussed two main approaches of, uh, two main families of approaches, multi arm bandit with a stochastic and Pelsarian and Markovian setting, and the online complex optimization. <laughs> That's the basis. Now it's your time to adopt, to adapt it to your framework, to your flavor of the problem. And I think that really sets the table to the natural next step, which is reinforcement learning. 
we continue, I'm happy to discuss reinforcement learning. So I think we'll be in another class. That's another chunk of work, and that's also a very interesting uh, step. Oh yeah, so so that's the end. Uh, as always, I always have a slide that say, "Oh, if you're looking for a postdoc job, please email me." But I don't want to steal. A, 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 sorry, a, a, a PhD. If you're looking for a PhD, just email me. But I don't want to steal. PhD student from another PI. So I adapted it to, if you're looking for an external state, send me an email. Uh, so that's my take on it. Also looking for postdoc as always, but uh, I don't want to, so yeah, so that's my research group on the right. And so, yeah, so I'll be hanging around uh, until Thursday. Uh, happy to have a chat about online optimization, about multi arm bandit, online decision-making, real-time decision-making, or any other uh, power system problem. I uh, hope you, have, you, you enjoyed this uh, this uh, this uh, this course, and I think we're all ready for lunch. Thank you.